your man, Louis T. Welcome to the command post. You know what it is. Post up. Take command. I, of course, am your commander in chief, Louis T. Thank you for joining me. Last night was an epic performance put on display by both teams in the NFC Championship game. San Francisco 49ers scoring 27 unanswered points to rally back and win 34 to 31. But also, more importantly for us as Commander fans, um, Ben Johnson in the Lions offense put on a show as well, scoring 31 points, 24 of them coming in the first half, and um, really putting themselves in a position to advance to Super Bowl 58, but falling short. Now, um, there are different and varying opinions as to why the Lions aren't preparing themselves for a contest against the Kansas City Chiefs next week or in two weeks uh, in Las Vegas with a chance to hoist their very first Lombardi trophy. Um, what I can tell you right now as a fan of the Commanders watching from afar, the weekend couldn't have gone any better first and foremost because we're going to make a hire this week. And had the Ravens won, had the Lions won, that wasn't going to take place. Now, it didn't really matter to me. I wasn't one of those people that was so impatient that I needed these teams to lose so that we could make our hire. Because whether we hire them now or in two weeks from now, wasn't going to make a difference one way or the other in terms of how the offseason is going to go. The sooner the better, right? You'd like to get this process started you'd like to get this over with and start moving on to the next phase of the offseason but at the end of the day january 31st versus february 15th isn't going to make that big of a difference to me honestly but there were a lot of you and i'm not gonna lie I, i'd much rather get it done sooner rather than later and for a lot of you the lions losing the ravens losing so now all of these interviews with say anthony weaver or, or mike mcdonald or Aaron Glenn or Ben Johnson can take place. And, and over the next two days, that's exactly what's going to happen. Washington is going to interview the two Ravens candidates, Anthony Weaver and Mike McDonald in person tomorrow or today, right? And then tomorrow, they're going to interview the two Lions candidates, Aaron Glenn and Ben Johnson, the two coordinators. Um, my understanding is that after all of these interviews take place, they're going to do their due diligence. But the, the guy they're zeroing in on is Ben Johnson. And after they have their interviews with everyone, they close the deal with Johnson. If, if everything, you know, checks out, dots, I's, T's crossed, they're going to make that announcement on Tuesday after those interviews. And if we don't hear anything Tuesday, we'll hear something Wednesday. And so um, that's my guess is that before the end of this month, we'll know who the next head coach of the Washington Commanders is going to be. I think we're going to find out tomorrow, honestly speaking. But again, if not tomorrow, definitely Wednesday. With that said, I want to talk about Ben Johnson and the masterclass he put on last night. But um, I think if there were ever any doubt, and there may still be some out there with some of the fans, watching what he did last night, once again, having another opportunity to watch this guy at work, how can you walk away anything but impressed? You know, I don't think there's any question as to what needs to be done at this point. If those questions existed before last night, if those questions existed before last week, if those questions existed before the start of the playoffs, I would hope that those were quelled over the last three weeks. What they did at the beginning of this game, what they did in the first half, <clears throat> what they did really the entire game for that matter. They put up 442 yards of total offense in this game. Jared Goff was in total command and total control of this game. They ran the football down the throats of the San Francisco 49ers. They really did whatever they wanted to do. And if not for the mistakes, they win this game. Now, I wanted to hear all of the different perspectives leaving last night's game. And I think most people were in agreement that this is the guy, right? Like there's no doubt Ben Johnson's the guy for the job and it's only a matter of time. You heard on the telecast, right? That Washington essentially has, for all intents and purposes, locked up Ben Johnson. Like this is a foregone conclusion. I think everybody in the league has assumed, which is why I think you saw so many hires last week. We're not waiting on Ben Johnson. 
we're not waiting on him because he's going to Washington. And I think you saw a lot of teams act accordingly, including Carolina, who knew they weren't going to get him unless he was willing to take this inordinate amount of money. But they said, you know what? We're not even going to wait. We're not going to even waste time waiting on him. We're just going to move on, right? Because we already know where he's heading. There's still a contingent of fans out there that want Mike McDonald. I'm not going to argue with you. He was spectacular yesterday as well. What he did to that Chiefs offense yesterday was outstanding. And he's been outstanding all season long. But I, I think this is my point that I've been making. And I think this is going to hammer it home even more. And then I want to attack a narrative that is out there circulating about Ben Johnson and his Lions offense. And then, then we'll get out of here, right? I don't want to keep you here longer than I need to. And I don't want to hold you hostage. But for those of you who want, want Mike McDonald, the Detroit Lions are about to be a fantastic case study, right, in how all of this works. I think we, we're watching the Buffalo Bills play out right in front of us as a case study that you shouldn't want any parts of. And I don't understand why this is a hard concept for some of you to grasp, right? In this league, offensive coaches, offensive head coaches, rather, are the best at getting the job done. When you look at the last 10 Super Bowls, when you look at the participants in those Super Bowls, it's abundantly clear who wins out in this league, the offensive-minded head coach or the defensive-minded head coach. Once upon a time when Belichick and Brady roamed the land and ruled the NFL landscape, then you could make the argument about a defensive head coach. But the thing that Belichick always had going for him was that he always had an offensive coordinator that he could trust that wasn't going anywhere, right? When they were dominant in New England, he had Josh McDaniels, and he was there pretty much the entire time. At the early stages, it was Charlie Weiss. Then it was Bill O'Brien, but he always had a guy, right? There was always a guy. It's rare in the league to find a coach that can do the things you need him to do for your team to be successful and then find that guy again and then find that guy again and then find that guy again as a defensive head coach, having to find offensive coordinators that get it over and over and over again. It's hard to do that. Buffalo, to me, is the perfect case study. We're going to get another example of that here in Detroit after Ben Johnson leaves. But I'm looking at Buffalo. I looked at the success Josh Allen had. This guy was this close to being the MVP of the league in 2020, I believe it was. 2020. This close to being league MVP took the Bills to the AFC Championship game in 2020. He hasn't been back to the AFC Championship game, and he hasn't been close to being the league MVP since. There have been times when we've maybe whispered his name as a potential candidate, but it hasn't lasted very long. The minute Brian Daybowl left and took the job in New York with the Giants, Josh Allen's ascension as one of the best quarterbacks in the league came to a screeching halt. Now, he hasn't, I don't think, regressed. He just hasn't continued to ascend, and neither have the Bills, right? You know why? It's not a coincidence. Because Brian uh, Daybowl, the offensive coordinator that was in sync, in lockstep with Josh Allen and how they wanted to attack defenses, moved on and got a head coaching job. And they really haven't been able to fill that void since. They tried Ken Dorsey upgrading uh, him from quarterback's coach to offensive coordinator. That worked for a little while. And then that grew stale quickly. And they fired him last year in season and promoted the other quarterback's coach, right? Joe Brady, and he came in and he did a, a solid job. But I can't stress to you enough, and maybe with a full off season, maybe Joe Brady implements more things and he gets more comfortable and they expand the offense more. But what I saw against Kansas City last week from the Bills was one of the worst 
games called in terms of utilizing a star quarterback. They treated Josh Allen like he was Zach Wilson in that game. Nothing stretched the field vertically other than the, the rainbow bomb he threw to Diggs that he dropped. Everything else was short at the line of scrimmage, behind it, and it was a dink and dunk, nickel and dime fest that Rich Gannon would be proud of. That, that Alex Smith might have to go to the bathroom and clean him, himself up over. But not the kind of guy like Josh Allen should be utilized with. It's hard to find an offensive play caller to marry with a young quarterback over and over and over again. You can find another defensive coordinator. Teams do it all the time. The 49ers have done it three times in the last five years with Robert Sala getting a job two years later, um, D'Amico Ryan's getting a job, and now Steve Wilkes is their coordinator. You can find another defensive coordinator. Teams do it all the time. It's hard to find another offensive guy, though. We're going to look at what happens with Tampa Bay and Baker Mayfield because they got a defensive-minded coach in Todd Bowles, and Dave Canales did a hell of a job in year one as the offensive coordinator there with Baker Mayfield, revitalizing his career. Now Baker's going to have to see if he can get it done with a new coordinator, and the Bucs are going to have to see if they can get it done with a new coordinator running that offense as well. Another case study right there for us to examine. But <clears throat> the biggest one will be the Lions. They were literally knocking on the door. They were on the doorstep, on the precipice of advancing to the Super Bowl with Ben Johnson as their offensive coordinator. And Dan Campbell, who is an offensive guy, but does not call plays, has never called plays, is going to have to find a new offensive coordinator. Now, there may be someone waiting in the wings, that they're going to promote, just like Buffalo did, just like Philadelphia did. Another case study of an offensive head coach who did call plays before but relegated that duties to someone else. Shane Steichen killed it, knocked it out of the park, got a head coaching job. They promoted Brian Johnson from within because that's the natural progression, right? Take the quarterback's coach who's very close with the quarterback, promote him because he knows what the quarterback likes, he knows his strengths, weaknesses, and he knows how to get the most out of this guy. Just promote the quarterback's coach. That's the natural progression, right? Should be a breeze. Look what happened to Philadelphia's offense. We're going to watch the Lions next year to see if they're able to continue what they just did. They were one of the most prolific offenses in the league the last two seasons. That's not an accident. That's Ben Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. They're talented. Yes, that offensive line is A1. Yeah, the receivers, they're damn good. The tight ends, excellent. Yeah, the running backs, are you kidding me? Yeah, I'm aware. Let's see him do it again next year without Ben Johnson. If that's not enough for you out there that still want Mike McDonald, I don't know what to tell you. The right decision is the offensive guy that gives you an opportunity to not mess with the continuity of the offense. That's what Ben Johnson offers us. And that's why, to me, it's a no-brainer. There's not even a question as to what needs to be done. And I thought his masterclass performance last night put an exclamation point on why he should be here in Washington. But Ben Johnson doesn't come without fault. He doesn't come without question marks. He's never done this before. If we hire Ben Johnson, no, when we hire Ben Johnson, he will become the youngest head coach in the NFL. That's right. He'll be 37 years old. And while the Patriots just hired Gerard Mayo and he's 37 and Sean McVay is still 37 and still the youngest coach technically in the NFL, now we're talking about months. McVeigh was born in January. Mayo was born in February. Our guy is born in May. So technically, he's going to be the youngest head coach in the league. That's how we're doing it around here. We got one of the youngest GMs in the NFL, 
and Adam Peters, and we're going to have one of the youngest, no, the youngest head coach in the NFL. That's how we changing shit over here. Out with the old, in with the innovative and new. You haven't heard one person say something negative about Ben Johnson's offensive scheme. Now, have you? Brees Hall, running back for the Jets, tweeted out last night, and several people sent it to me, about how Jameer Gibbs' attempts and how he's being utilized is a running back's dream. That's another running back in the league watching the Detroit Lions offense and how Jameer Gibbs is being deployed saying, damn, I wish I had that kind of play calling for me. It's not rocket science. Ben Johnson is the truth. But there is a narrative out there that has some legitimacy to it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond to it right now. Let's take a look. So I tweeted this out watching the game. I could see this avalanche coming, and I felt the momentum shifting in the game when the Lions went for it on fourth down the first time at 24 to 14 and didn't get, or 24 to 10, excuse me, and didn't get it. And it, it prompted me to tweet out, if you live aggressively, the death will be spectacular, right? And I was referencing Dan Campbell's decisions, and that's who he's been his entire career as a head coach. So I'm not going to, to pile on him. And I said this much last night, and I, I remain resolute in how I feel. He did what he's been doing, and that's part of the reason they were at the point where they were at. So you can't be mad when the results aren't favorable. Because if it worked, we'd be calling him a genius, and we'd be talking about how ballsy he was. It didn't work, so now it's the wrong decision. He shouldn't have done it, and they lost the game because of him. You got to either be who you are, or don't do it at all. But you can't be in the middle. That's what Ron Rivera did to us. We never knew what the hell. But at least the Lions knew exactly what they were getting themselves into. They knew they were going for it. I'd much rather be in that position than to sit there and be questioning, well, what are we going to do? However, my guy Ed, Ed O'Neill. And uh, me and Ed been chopping it up for years. Ed is a, a devout Lions fan. He's been through the ups, the downs. And this had to be a great year for him and, and a very exciting and fun season for Ed. But it didn't end the way that Ed wanted it to end. And so he tweeted at me, have fun with Ben. His play calling disappears in the third. And to which I responded, Ed, buddy, don't do that, Okay. You would love nothing more than to have him back next year. Listen, they drove the ball down the field and Josh Reynolds dropped the ball on fourth down. Okay. That was the second possession of the third quarter. Um, then Gibbs fumbled on the very next possession of the third quarter. And then he drew up two gems on the, on the final possession of the third quarter. One to Sam Laporta where I, I really feel like Jared Goff needed to throw that back shoulder away from the defender that was coming to put the hit on him, which dislodged the football. And then on the third down, right after that, he threw, he drew up a dime, a gem of a play, and golf delivered a dime, a dot to Josh Reynolds, and he just flat out dropped it. Man coverage coming across the field on a deep on on a you know uh, a over route, and he was wide ass open, and he just dropped it. I guess that's Ben Johnson's play calling in the third quarter. I guess I guess it disappeared, just disappeared into thin air. I said, we will have fun with Ben, thanks. I said, you should be thanking him for the memories, right? But this isn't to attack Ed, because Ed is a fan of the Lions, and he's watched Ben Johnson all season long. He's watched him for the last two years as their offensive coordinator, and there is a narrative that exists that this Lions offense struggles in the third quarter. And if you watch the playoffs, what did we talk about after the wild card weekend game? Well, they came out like gangbusters. 11, a 10 play drive, 75 yards touchdown. 11 play drive, 75 yards touchdown. 10 play drive, touchdown. 21 points on the first three possessions of the game. They couldn't be stopped. What happened in the second half? They only got a field goal. Right? Only scored three points in the second half. But they hung on and they won 24 to 23. 
So there's a narrative that exists. So Ed isn't wrong about talking about the third quarter in particular with Ben Johnson, but I, disappearing is a bit of a, a reach. And I need you to understand, in that moment, 11 hours ago, when Ben tweeted, this, when Ed tweeted this out, he was hurting. Ed, Ed was hurting, okay? And you know what hurt people do? They hurt people. Ed wasn't looking to, to be malicious, but he was hurt. And he knows Ben Johnson is leaving, and that hurts too. So not only did we lose, not only are we not going to have the mastermind of this offense back, we might not get back here again, and we had a shot, and we blew it. I'm hurting. So you know what I want to do? I want to hurt you. And again, Ed's a good dude, man. I've been talking to Ed for years. It's been a while. I haven't talked to Ed in a long time, but Ed's a good dude. But Ed, Ed was looking... Ed was looking to throw a dart. He was hurting. So he wanted to hurt somebody else. But in, in saying that, there is a, some truth to this statement. Not necessarily that it's play call and disappears, but there has been a narrative surrounding Ben Johnson about third quarters in, in the second half in particular. Because what he's done this season and last season in particular is, um, is he's he's been excellent in the first half of games. They've jumped out to some big leads. And one game stuck out like a sore thumb to me that reminded me a lot of last night's game with a different outcome, but it reminded me a lot of last night. It was the New Orleans Saints game that they played um, earlier this season, probably December, if I had to guess. Early December, late November, they played the Saints. This was right around the time they were struggling. Lions were struggling. They needed to pick me up. So I want to say it was the first weekend of December or the last weekend of November because they had just lost to the Packers on Thanksgiving. I think they had gotten run by um, not too long before then. They got run by Baltimore. That was like week seven or eight. Then Thanksgiving was week 12. They had a, a, a near loss to the Bears where they should have lost at home the week prior to Thanksgiving. So they were struggling, right? They go to New Orleans and they jumped those boys. Before New Orleans could, New Orleans could even blink, it was like 21 nothing, and it was 24-7 at halftime. Sound familiar to you, 24-7 at half? Well, the Saints come roaring back. And that thing is within a score. And then they, they score a touchdown. Jamison Williams scores a touchdown. They go for two. They don't get it. It's 33 um, I think the score at that point was 33 to 21. I think, I think it was 27, 21. Like they had gotten all the way back in the game, but that touchdown made it, um, 33 to 21. And then the lions gave up a, a late touchdown, I believe. Won the game like 33-27, 33-28, something like that. But they held on in that game. They weren't able to do it, obviously, in, in uh, last night's game in the NFC Championship. But it, it got me to thinking about second halves, specifically the third quarter. We'll talk about the fourth quarters a little bit too. But I want to I address this narrative that this Lions offense struggles in the second half, which you, if someone starts talking about the third quarter with an offensive coordinator or a defensive coordinator, the first thing you start thinking about is lack of adjustments, right? That's that's what you're insinuating without actually saying it. So I wanted to go to the numbers. So what I did was I charted every game this season for the Lions and whether they scored in the third quarter or not, were they outscored in the third quarter, and then what happened thereafter, Okay. Because the game doesn't end in the third quarter. There's still another quarter of football after afterwards, right? So how do you rebound? Okay, so you didn't score in the fourth quarter or the third quarter. What would you do in the fourth quarter, right? Did you outscore the opposition in the fourth quarter? Because a lot of these games, the Lions were winning at halftime. It's not like they were trailing. And in, in, in many instances, up big at halftime, okay? So there's there is definitely a human element there that you relax a little bit. Maybe you start playing against the clock 
Maybe you start making a concerted effort to run it a little bit more and you stop being as aggressive if you, as you were in the first half because now you're trying to bleed clock. And hopefully Ben Johnson has learned a little bit from that where you never take your foot off the gas in any, in any, at any point, no matter how much you're up by, right? I don't think he took his foot off the gas against San Francisco at all, period, right? We've gone through this exercise already. They didn't score. They went three and out on the opening drive of the second half. Both teams did. They got the ball after San. Well, they went three and out. Well, both teams went three and out. I said that right. And then the then the Forty uh, Niners, um, or or no no, the Forty Niners went down the field. I got the wrong game. I was thinking about the Chiefs Ravens game, where both teams went three and out to start the second half. The Forty Niners drove it down the field and got a field goal. Then the Lions drove it down the field, and they could have opted for that same field goal. But they didn't. They went for it. And Reynolds dropped the football. Right? The next drive, the 49ers score a touchdown. The Lions fumbled the football on the very first play. The 49ers then score a field goal. The Lions drove right down the field. Well, actually, they punted. But on second down, he draws up a, a, a hell of a play for Sam Laporta, open over the middle, and golf led him into a hit. Ball's dislodged and incomplete. Third down, he draws up another gem. Gets Josh Reynolds wild open, and he drops it. The 49ers get the football back. They kick a field goal. They take the lead. Now they're up three. The Lions respond, move it down the field, get back in the field goal range. They go for it again. And they fail again. So is that really Ben Johnson's fault? Because on that failed second attempt, Josh Reynolds, and I don't know if you trust him at this point, is screaming wide open on a deep dig over the middle of the field inside the 49ers 10-yard line. And golf at that point, didn't have to vacate the pocket yet. There wasn't immense pressure. He vacated the pocket because he felt like he was standing there too long and felt like, hey, my, my clock is going off. I got to get out of here. But if he just stood in there, he could have delivered the ball down the field. At the end of the day, let's go through this quick chart that I put together. So out of 20 games, we're including the postseason. Okay, we're including the postseason. The Lions played 20 games this season. 17 regular season contests, three in the postseason. So 20 total. Out of 20 games, the Lions did not score in the third quarter of seven of them. Okay? Seven of the games. So 13 games they did score in the third quarter. Seven of them they did not. Of the 20 games... They played in this season. They were outscored in the third quarter in half of them, 10, okay? Outscored in the third quarter. Mind you, in most of these games, they were ahead, and not just ahead by three or four, you know, or seven points, ahead by two or more scores at halftime. But they were outscored half of the games this season in the third quarter, 10 games outscored in the third quarter. Of the games that I just mentioned, whether seven games that they did not score in the third quarter or the 10 games that they were outscored in the third quarter, and some of those games overlap, obviously, um, because you can not score, and the opposition can not score. And there were several games where neither team scored in the third quarter, and then there were games where Detroit didn't score and the opposition did, so they outscored them, right? So those two can overlap, not scoring and, and being outscored. So really what we care about is the 10 games that they were outscored in the third. Because even if you didn't score and you weren't outscored, you still didn't score, right? How do you rebound? So the 10 games where they were outscored in the third quarter, six of those games, whether they didn't score or were outscored, 
six of those games, they outscored the opposition in the fourth quarter. So they bounced back, scored more than the other team did in the fourth when it mattered the most to either secure the victory or to give them a chance to win. So, again, I think this is a false narrative. I think that there are some learning uh, and teachable moments that can be taken from some of the games this year where maybe he might have taken his foot off the gas pedal a little bit. You had a a ton of success in the first half, and you felt like, all right, you know, maybe we can establish the run a little bit, maybe burn a clock, maybe have an eight-minute drive, shorten this game a bit. We're up big. But overall, he's given the Detroit Lions a chance to win in all four quarters this season. The third might not have been his best quarter, but he's usually rallied to put them in a position in the fourth quarter to either close out the ball game that they started out like gangbusters or to come back and win a game that they might have let slip a bit in the third quarter, whatever the case may be. Ben Johnson has been outstanding for the Detroit Lions this season. He was outstanding for them last season. And this narrative about the third quarter and his play calling disappearing, that's trash, right? That's garbage. Understand that Ben Johnson is giving the Detroit Lions, has given the Detroit Lions opportunities to win more games than they lost. And they're going to miss him. They're going to miss him. Their loss is our game, and I'm looking forward to that game here in Washington because we deserve it. (laughs) We truly do, and I can't wait for it. What says you? Ben Johnson, right man for the job here in Washington. Have we gotten to that conclusion yet? I still see some Mike McDonald stands out there. I'm not mad at you. And I'm pretty sure those Mike McDonald stands would be receptive to Ben Johnson, just like I would be receptive to Mike McDonald. But my biggest takeaway is that you don't want to find yourself in the position that the Texans will eventually find themselves in when Bobby Slowick is no longer their offensive coordinator and they got to find someone to replace him to pair with C.J. Stroud. You don't want to be in that position. You don't want to be where the Lions are going to be with Jared Goff next year. You don't want to be where the Bucks are going to be with Baker Mayfield next year. You don't want to be where the, Bear, where, the where the Bills are right now with Josh Allen. You don't want to be where the Bears are with Justin Fields or have been. And, and it's not because they lost a great uh, offensive coordinator. They just never found one. <laughs> you don't want to be in that position. Trust me. Trust me. That's the same thing that happened with the Chargers. They could never find the right offensive coordinator to pair with Justin Herbert. That's why Brandon Staley got fired. Look, Staley wasn't great as a head coach overall. And the defense didn't match what they thought they were getting from Brandon Staley when he came from Los Angeles and the number one overall defense in the NFL. They never got that in L.A. But they also never got top-notch coordinating to pair with Justin Herbert. You don't want that. You got an opportunity to get that here in Washington in Ben Johnson, marry him with whomever the quarterback is. Whether it's Sam Howe or it's somebody in the draft or they trade for somebody, whatever. You got a chance to marry that QB with Ben Johnson as the play caller for the next 12 to 15 years. Don't you want that? Instead of having to find a coordinator and then hope he's really good and in in hoping that he's really good, hoping that he stays for more than two or three years because if he's really good at his job, somebody's going to come and take it. Don't you want to not have to worry about that? I would hope that the decision is easy at this point. I would hope that you would understand that. The likelihood is we don't know which of these coaches is better between Mike McDonald or, you know, Ben Johnson. We don't know who's the better leader of men, et cetera, et cetera. 
But what I can tell you is you can find somebody to run the defense. It's really hard to find somebody to run your offense. And if you do find somebody to keep him before somebody comes and snatches him away. Anyway, I digress. I'm feeling damn good today. I woke up this morning feeling dangerous. <laughs> I watched what I watched last night and it just confirmed for me. It just added that exclamation point that, God damn, we about to have one of the best to do it. I'm, I'm looking across social media landscape and I'm looking at some of our most hated rivals and they over here admiring our stuff. They only admiring it because it's not ours yet. As soon as we get it, now it's trash, right? But I couldn't help but watch LB say, man, Ben Johnson is so creative as a play caller. I tried to warn him. He didn't want to hear it when I tried to tell him he's about to be our next head coach. He's over there drooling. They got Kellen Moore. Ugh, that's nasty. Not my problem. We on the way up. Damn, it feels good to be a Commanders fan. We don't get to say that very often. Damn, it feels good to be a Commanders fan right now. We just we just got to continue to make the right moves. That's it. One move at a time, continue to make the right moves and the right decisions. The first right decision was Josh Harris taking over this team. There are a lot of people interested he was the right man for the job. The next right move was firing Ronald Rivera. Done. The next move was getting Adam Peters. Done. Now the next move, that's the right move, is hiring Ben Johnson. Do you agree or not? And if you don't, I'd love to hear why down in the comment section. If you do agree, I'd like to hear why in the comment section as well. Anyway, you guys, have a good one. Take care. That air, boy, it feels crisp, fresh, new, just like it feels to be a Commanders fan right now. It feels brand new. Doesn't it? Mm, mm, mm. Let me say this one more time, and I'm, I'm lying, because I'm going to say it again, and probably again. Mortimer, we're back. Louis.